Okay, so picking up where we left off last class, we now have an operating system that takes um, a program on the hard drive and cuts it up into equally sized blocks, which we call pages. Some textbooks call them frames, but we'll call them pages. And then some textbooks say you take a page and put it into a frame. That's like a location in main memory. Where would we put it? So, for example, suppose our main memory looked like this. Operating system starts up, loads in. I'm sorry, the, the computer boots up. First thing we do is we load <coughs> the operating system at the beginning. And then let's say, just to have a small example, let's say we have 10 frames left. So we have a total of 10 frames for programs that are running. And suppose we have, uh, out on a hard drive, suppose we have program A. Pro process A, which is three pages. Which really means it's two point something pages. It's just, you know, we can fit the whole thing into three pages. And process B, three pages. Okay, and then process C is one page. Process D is one page. Process E and F are three pages. Okay, so if A comes along and wants to, I, so I put them in alphabetical order in the order in which they'll be coming into our system. So if A came in, where would we put it? I guess intuitively, since it's all our memory, not our system memory, but our user memory, is all empty, we could put A right in, we could load A right into here. A can go here, here, and here. If the operating system decided to take the whole program in at once, not part of it now, part of it later. So we could put A in these three frames. Okay. Then B comes along. B comes along. And Then C needs to come into memory. A little later on in time, C needs to come in. And C is one frame. So C can go right there. Okay? So now, process B finishes. So we can free up this storage. Okay. So this is what our memory looks like. Now D needs to come in and D is one page. Where would you put it? And again, so it's an operating systems question, which means there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. There's just, depending on situations, some answer might be better than none. Where, so of the 10 frames that have remained, 10 page frames, for pages of a process to come in, where would you put it? So we really have a few choices. What, actually, we have, Let's see if anyone comes up with any new choices. But what are our choices? Should we just keep going where we left off and then when we get to the bottom, go back to the top? Should we always start at the top and then find the first spot that it'll fit? Do you have any suggestions? Go to the first, start at the top, go to the first empty space because that leaves the biggest block up in the bottom. What, so wait, so this, we'll, do, we'll do a couple of them, but the first empty space that it could fit in? Go back to your top, go down, and take the first empty space after A. 
Okay, so in this particular example, that was one page, but let's say this was two. You're still working. So it's the first space that it will fit in. That will fit in. Okay. Or you or you could split it between if you had like Right, like put one part here and one part here. Right. Maybe if A had finished first, B was still running, C and D were running, C finished, and then E needed to come in, you could put it in the two spaces that were A, A was in and the space that C was in. Okay, but yeah, so once and that's what we talked about that last class, we could scatter them, but then that requires we have a table of where all the scattered pieces are. Okay, but right now, let's say we're just putting them in contiguous spots for easy management. We yeah. could put it here. Right, but if you're doing it in contiguous boxes, then you'll put it behind C. But the uh, process of probably doesn't go the next one coming into the need three. Right, actually, the, 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 most, the best thing to, would be if we could see the future, <laughs> right? Then we would know where to put it. But so if we can't see the future, we could have kept going and put it down here, but let's say we put it here. Now we have two blocks here and four blocks here. If the next two processes coming in were a two and a four, it would be perfect. It's kind of like running a restaurant, right? You know, you have t a table that seats six people and four people show up. Do you see them there? Or maybe a family of six is coming right behind them and you made a mistake, maybe not. You know, it's, it's kind of like that idea. So now if E comes in, which needs three places. If we wanted to do them contiguously, we'd have to do this. E, E, E. And then F comes in, and we don't have room for F if we want to do it contiguously. We could put F here, here, and here, but then we'd have to create a table, because we're scattering. Or you could, move, you could force C to move, and then put F in those, couldn't you? Put the processor move C's location while it's running. Yeah, that's another thing. Uh, that, I mean, you know, a separate thread could come in and this one, we wouldn't want it to be on the ready queue. Uh, uh, we wouldn't want it to be running, but while it's on the ready queue, if we could relocate it, then we'd have one too. Okay. So, some of the choices of where to, where to, uh, where to put them, three of the most common choices would be, um, an algorithm called uh, first fit. And then, uh, so first fit was, I think, what's kind of intuitively, like what you were saying. Start at the beginning and then just go down until you find the first spot that could fit it, throw it in there. What we're really hoping for is with these numbers to line up right, and we don't know what these numbers are. You, can't, you couldn't really make the argument that try to keep even blocks, try to keep your restaurant with a bunch of tables for four, that might not be good. Maybe you want a table for six and a table for two. You don't know who's coming in next. <clears throat> so the first fit is probably the quickest one to choose a location because you're just going down here looking for the first fit. You could go for the best fit. That's another page. That's another um, algorithm for picking where to put a program if you require that they be contiguous in memory. So the best fit is looking at the size of what's coming in, and then you're checking all your open blocks and finding the one that's closest to it so there's as little waste as possible. And I said, can anyone argue that might not be such a good idea? Then the, the other extreme of that would be what's called the worst fit. And that would be where you're looking for the block that's so big that when you put this one in, there'll still be a reasonable size chunk left over. And that might be a good idea too. Then with, with the worst fit, you have a lot of medium-sized empty chunks. With the best fit, you're going to have some big blocks, but then you're also going to have little areas of waste because this, you always look for the tightest squeeze and you might end up with one frame that's open. Both the best fit and the worst fit will take more time because you're required to search your entire memory looking for either the best fit or the worst fit. Whereas the first fit is the quickest one. Just find the first block that'll fit and throw it there. You don't have to do any more thinking. Of course, the problem is, again, you've got to go in the future because if that one we just did, worst fit would have 
made everything fit the best. Yeah, so in this case, right, so in this case, as it turned out, and again, there's no right algorithm for, it, it really depends on what's coming in in the future. So there really is no right algorithm, unless you can see the future. So we had A, A, B, 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 C, and then B went away. And now D needs to come in. So we have a block of three here and a block of four here. First fit would put it here. Best fit would say, well, I want to leave a big block open and try to use up the smaller block, would also put it here. So best fit and first fit would put D here. But worst fit, which kind of tries to keep a lot of medium-sized blocks around, would put it in the biggest spot, D, over here. And then as it turned out, with a three and a three, they fit. B, E, F, not E, E, and then F, F, F. Now obviously I'm just making these numbers up. If I did this, two and four, worst fits no more. And best fit is, best fit would work good, and first fit would work just as good as best fit, but faster. So, and again, there's no right, there's no right way or wrong way. Just depends on, and, and again, the best thing would be if you could look into the future. Okay, so if we now have, um, now we'll talk about the case where the operating system gives a set of blocks for our process. Let's say a fixed number, and in a little while. We'll talk about what's the best number to give. But let's say a process, uh, I'm sorry, the operating system gives us a certain number of frames. Let's say one, two, three frames for us to put our program in. So let's say we had a, a program that was four pages long, but the operating system only gives us three slots to put them in. So obviously we have to pick one of our frames to be, one of our pages to not be in one of our three frames. So suppose we had four pages, or let's say we had pages A, B, C, and D. So we put A in here to start, B here and C here. If our program is running and makes a reference to the D page, that's out on the disk drive. So we have to go get it. But the operating system isn't giving us a fourth frame, so we have to pick one of these three to get rid of. To make room for the one we need to now execute from. Which page do we get rid of? So again, that's an operating systems question, so there's no right answer. You can do first used or least used. Okay, so let's say we had, let's say over time, we started off our program starts off at the beginning, so that's page A. Runs for a little while. Then we needed page B, so then we loaded B in. Then we needed C. Then let's say C jumped back to A and started executing out of A again, so then we started referring to A. And I think that should make it interesting enough. So, so this would so this is time going this way, right? So, which one would you now kick out? So, like, what is what is your algorithm? What is your page replacement algorithm? Meaning, what page are you kicking out to bring in the new one? You would either you could either do first used on the theory that if it was the start of the program, you're not going to need it as often, or you could do least used. Okay, so wait, so first, first use, that's good. First use, and then least used. Least frequent, yes, least often used. If you had one page that was used less often than the others. Okay, least frequently used. So that's on a per instruction basis? Okay, so 
So, like, so for example, if this, if we load it in this first page, and a lot of the instructions keep coming out of here, and then it jumped here and did one, and then came back here and did this one a lot, then jumped out here and did one, then came back here and did this one a lot. This is one we want around, right? Because it seems to be used a lot. So now you're keeping count on a per instruction basis. You're not just saying like, well, we loaded this in, and then we loaded this one in, and then we loaded this one in. You're keeping count of how often they're being used. And you're using the past to predict the future. We don't, you know, it's kind of like stocks. You, you want to know the future, not the past, but you're using the past to help predict the future. So you're, what we really like to know is in the future, if I'm trying to put D into here, what I'd really like to know is in the future, out of A, B, and C, which one is going to be used the, where the next use is most furthest into the future? That's the one I'd like to kick out. But if we can't see the future, we can look at the past and try to guess at the future. So least, re least frequently used, le wait, least frequently used. So frequency, that's going to be, how would you calculate that? That would be how many times, like let's say over the last 100 instructions, how frequent were each pick? So you'd have to pick a time interval and then say over the last X number of instructions. Could you use the time interval too? You know, you spend uh, 20 minutes on A, then you spend 5 minutes on B, go back to A for 15 minutes. Go to C for two minutes, go back to A for 20 minutes. How much time is spent in each? Would that not be used? Yeah, I guess the, the thing I'm getting, this is not a textbook one, but I, I kind of like this idea. That um, Well, let, yeah, let, let's come back to this in a second. So, a, a and, and we'll just kick this idea around. But some common ones that are used are first in, first out. So that just says, like in this case, it went A, B, C, then it referred back to A, and now we're ready to kick one out. The first one to get loaded was A. So let's kick that one out. This one, now how would we implement this one? How do you keep track of the order that they're coming in? We can't just say it's the one up in the first block, because then eventually, a will get kicked out, D will come in, and we can't say D was the first one in. We'd have to have some kind of pointer that keeps rolling. The way we could implement this is what? We could have a linked list? A queue? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We could have a link, uh, a queue. That says A, B, C, and here's the header. Every time a new page comes in, we put a link on the end of the list. And every time we have to kick somebody out, we go to the one at the beginning of the list. That's all. So this is keeping an order of when they came in. So we would update the list every time a page is loaded, which doesn't happen that often. So there's not a whole lot of overhead in this first in, first out method. Another method would be least recently. used, which, I mean, I like that this is a little bit different than that, but least recently used says if we used, we loaded A and used it, we loaded B, used it, loaded C, used it, A is still in memory from before, but we're using it again. So we want to somehow update the fact that A has now been recently used. A has been used the most recently. Even though it was loaded in longest ago, it's the most recently used one. So then we would want to get rid of B, because that's the one that was used going into the past. That's the one that goes back the furthest into the past. So how could we implement that? Again, again a Q, right? But so this was a Q that we kept track of when they were loaded. Circular link list with a point. Um, let's see, so if we had, if, if we, now it's not based on when it was loaded, so first in, first out is based on when the page came in. How often it's used is ignored, it's just we want to know when it came in. Least recently used, it's 
on a per instruction basis. Every time an instruction is used, we want to record somehow, okay, that page was just used. So this one's going to be very intensive. This is going to, we're going to have a thread running just keeping track of this that's going to chew, chew up a lot of time. But anyway, how will we implement it? So we have A, then B, then C, then A gets used again. So we want usually the head is the one that goes, and the tail is the stuff we're keeping around. But we want to have A, B. So basically every time a page, this is one way to implement it, if you can think of a fast one, that's good, but one way we could implement this is keep A linked list, but every time any page gets used, we have to kind of find it wherever it is in the linked list. Like for example, we could have went A, B, C, and then B got used. So we'd have to go out to the middle of the link list and take this link and put it on the end. Right? So if A got reused, like this schedule, then this A would get moved. The head would now be B. And A would be put on the end of the link list. So this is basically saying this is the least recently used one, then the next least recently, and so on. But we'd have to keep, every time we touch, a, every time we execute a line, we have to make sure that the page it came from is now at the end of this list. So this is, a, I think, a, a better method for predicting. Again, we're using the past to predict the future. But we're taking this value, we're, we're, we're taking this method to predict the future, but the least recently used one is a pretty popular way of guessing which one's not going to be used in the future based on the past. But this one is more intensive. So now the idea you were saying, the least frequently used, that kind of takes into account, it's not, see like the, what's not so good about this least recently used one, let's say we had a page, like let's say page B was loaded into memory, hardly ever gets used. Maybe one out of every 1,000 instructions we make a reference to it, but it just so happened we hit it recently. That would still be a good one to get rid of, but least recently used would say, well, it was used recently. That's not too good. Whereas the least frequently used, if we could say over the last 10,000 instructions, this one's being used 90% of the time, this one's being used 1% of the time, this one's being used 9% of the time, we would get rid of B. Now, if the 1% happened to be very recently, least recently used would keep it around. So, how can we come up with statistics like that? This is, by the way, this is, I've never seen this out there before, so. We'd have to pick a time period. So for the last, well, we could say since the beginning. You can create a marker for each one, and every time it's used, just add one to the marker. Yeah, so we have an integer for every page. Right. Start them all at zero, and every time it's used, add one to it, then maybe we could keep these numbers in like a heap so we could always know which, you know, and the mid heap would be the one at the top. And that's the one we kick out. So you would keep the count since the beginning of the program. And then it's tough to get into what if like for the first hour, this one was used very frequently, but then had a stop, it's still going to have a high percentage. Like maybe every once in a while, we refresh the numbers. Or so. You start to realize whatever algorithm you come up with, and there's still research going on for the best algorithms for picking. You want to, um, you're using the past to predict the future, which isn't always accurate. And whatever algorithm you pick, you have to take into account, you don't want it to be too intensive to maintain, like these cues would be pretty intensive to maintain. Because you're trying to speed up your program running by having a better algorithm, but if the algorithm's taking up all the processor time, then it's not very helpful. Okay, so some other methods would be um, a, a close approximation of least recently used is one called, textbooks call it not used recently. And it's the same idea, but instead of maintaining this queue, which would be very intensive every time you touch a, uh, a page, you have to play with the queue. 
Uh, what's not used recently, you could do something like have a bunch of bits, zeros or ones. And the first time you load in the page, it gets set to zero, and then if you use it, you set it to one. So one means it's been used recently. Zero means it hasn't been. It's not the greatest approximation for it, but it's very easy to maintain. And then from time to time, you can just shut all the bits off, and then it's like they're all tied again. And then whichever one gets used, it gets set to one. Then you can decide one bit is not enough to maintain that, so maybe you could have two bits. So the page would have to be touched several times. So you have one bit for however many times you want the page to be set before you decide I'm going to keep this one around because it's been used recently. Um, okay, and then there's a couple of other ones I'll just put in the notes. Okay, so suppose we had a uh, we do this. Suppose we had a string that was a reference string. So we'll do an example like this. Okay. Um, we have a reference string. So let's say we have pages. I'll do numbers now. One, two, three. And we use first in and first out. And we're given three frames. So if we're given three frames, one, two, three, and we use this reference frame, what's going to happen? We're going to load in page one. So our memory, the operating system gave us three, three pages. Our memory, after we start running here, we load in the first page. So we just have page one and two blanks. Then we have one and two. And then one, two, and three. Okay, and now we hit what we're going to call our first page full. That means our program made a reference. Our program made a reference to page four. And uh, our, our program made a reference to page four, and there's no room for it. Which one would we kick out? So we're using first in, first out. Which one would we kick out? We'd kick out one, right? So we'd have four, two, and three. And this would end up, well, these are all actual page faults because when the program started, the page wasn't in memory. Okay, so now, <coughs> now we go for page, page three gets referenced. That one's okay because it's in memory. Then page four gets referenced. Page four gets referenced. So our memory still stays the same. Page four gets referenced, no problem there. Then page two gets referenced again, no problem there. Now page one gets referenced. Which one would go if we're using first in, first out? Page two would have to go, so one would come in here, so our frames look like this. So at time, when this is going on, we have page four, page one, page three. That one is a problem. And then we have three and four come in. And then uh, three and four get referenced, and they're fine. So we had one, two, three, four, five. Five times we had to go out to the disk drive and bring a page in. Okay. <coughs> okay, so now suppose you were using last in first out. What would change? Probably not a good method, but 
we would have three come in, we'd have another page full, one, two. Then we have four again, another page full. One, two, and four. Then two needs to get referenced, I would say one, two, and four. One, two, and four, when one gets referenced. Now three has to go. I'm sorry, four has to go, so make one for three. And that's a page four. And one, two, and four, we have another problem. So this would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 pages. So the last one was, last one was how many? Five. Five? Okay. Last in, first out, ended up being nine. Okay? Well then, just erase these spots again. Suppose, what's another element we use? How about, how about least, re uh, least recently used? Oh, uh, yeah, it was recently used. So that's the one where we're keeping a queue of, um, we do least recently used. That's where we're keeping a queue of, updating a queue every time the page gets touched. So, when four needs to come in, what would happen? Four needs to come in. The least recently used one is one. So Four would come in here, and we'd have a page full. Now three needs to come in. Three spot. Four, two, three. No page full. Four is referenced. Again, we're fine with the four, two, three set. Two is referenced. Now one is referenced. Which one would go with least recently used? So at this point in time, two and four are the most recently used out of two, three, and four. So three would go. Okay. And that makes room for one, and we have a page full there. Now three comes in. So that happened to be the one that just went out. So here's a case where we looked at the past to predict three is probably not going to be used soon, and this time we can't. Wait. So it moved. Of course, four is the least recently used. Right, and then, yeah, so like, it's kind of like the, the numbers were kind of rigged up to just make not common results, but just an illustration point. So, uh, from the point where out of these three pages, one has been used very recently, two somewhat recently, and three is the uh, fourth or least recently used. So we go three, two, one, and we have a page full. And now four needs to come in, so one and three are used recently, so two would go. It would be three. Seven. So this has seven. So now granted, depending on the string, if these different algorithms will get better and worse results. What's the absolute best result we can what's the benchmark to say that went pretty good or that went pretty bad? If you could use magic or use looking into the future, that always gives us the answer. What's the best answer? Now we might not be able to do this, but just to get an idea of how good these algorithms are, what would be like if we had to, if we wanted to come up with an algorithm that will be optimal algorithm, an algorithm would be never be better than it. Say optimal. Meaning out of all any algorithm you could ever come up with, you could never beat this one. What's the thing you could never beat? That's the one where we look into the future. Right? Which generally doesn't happen. You don't, normally you don't load a program and have to start running and you can say, oh, I can see it's going to jump to that page next. You don't, normally don't know that. But if you could look into the future, which would be the best one to pick? So we've already had three page faults here. Now four needs to come in. Well, three, four, two, one is the one most furthest into the future that we're not going to need. So it would be nice if we can see this, we would kick out one. Which you already did under FIFO. Yeah, which just so happened FIFO got that one right, I guess. So then we have four, two, and three. That's a page full. And now we're good for a while. Four, two, three. Four, two, three. Four, two, three. So we have no page faults here. Now one needs to come in. In the future, we need three and four. So we'll kick out two. So that would be. So that's a page full there. 
four, one, three, right? And then we'll do it until the end. Four, one, three, four, one, three. So the benchmark is one, two, three, four, five. You can never beat five, and it turns out, luckily or whatever, first in, first out happens to match it. That doesn't mean first in, first out is the best way, it's just for this string. This is what we'll call a reference string. For that particular reference string, that ended up being uh, the best answer. So it gives you an idea, like you could, once you're, in, so if you pick an operating, if the operating system picks a method and lets it run, you could collect data on it, and then you could, now that, now that you know the reference string, you could see how good your algorithm was comparing it to the optimal value. Okay. So, um, now I want to just talk about how much, if, if the operating system could, um, if the operating system gives us a fixed number of frames to run with, is there a minimum number of frames or maximum number of frames that they could give us so that um, well yeah so let, let's focus from this point of view is there a maximum number of frames that they gave if they gave us I'm trying to think of the best way to say this if they gave us a certain number of frames we're going to have page faults, and then because we have page faults, every time we have a page fault, our program goes from the running state to the ready state, right? We're running, so obviously we executed an instruction. The instruction said make a reference to a page that's currently not in memory. We then had to go out to the disk drive to bring the page in. So obviously we're going to get taken off the processor because it takes a little while for the page to come in from memory. Might as well let some other process run. And then we'll get back on later on. So is there a point where the operating system can give us a certain set of pages, a certain set of frames, and if they gave us more frames, it really doesn't help? Like you, you'd always think, intuitively you'd think, the more frames the operating system gives us, the better off we are, right? But is there a point where the amount of time we spend on the processor does not increase if the operating system gives us more than a certain number? So let's say, for example, I don't know, does that, does that even make sense? <laughs> the question I'm saying, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive, but maybe this example will make sense. Well, if you have five frames in that, in that example over there, one's going to be wasted. Okay, yeah, in the last example, if we had five frames, oh, that, yeah, that's a good one. One would be wasted, so the operating system shouldn't, it shouldn't give us more frames than our entire program would ever need because they're just taking away from some other program. But let's say, with a, like in the last example we went over, let's say if they gave us three frames, we're still going to have page faults from time to time, but if they gave us two frames, we might not, the amount of time we spend on the processor might not decrease. And if that's true, they might as well only give us two frames. Uh, so let, let me go over an example. Suppose, suppose we had a processor, suppose we had a computer, a, a program that was running. It's the only program on our system. And the operating system gave us what we're now going to call a working set. S. That's the number of frames the operating system gives us to operate, to, to program that. So like in that last example, they gave us three frames. So if the set S, in that last example, was three, they give us three frames to operate out of. If we're the only program in the whole system running, how much time, so, and let's say we, we had page faults. From time to time, we're going to run, and then we're going to have to stall because we're going out to the disk drive to bring a page in. What percentage of the time will we be running, and what percentage of the time will we be going out to the disk drive to get a page? So let's say small t is the time to execute an instruction.
Okay, so that's the time to execute one instruction. And let's say big T is the time to get a page, to get the page we want from memory. So big T is the amount of time it takes to get a page from memory. And little t is little t is the uh, little t is the amount of time to run the instruction if it's if the page is currently in memory. And then we'll say M of S is the miss ratio. The miss ratio, if, we, if the operating system gives us S frames, like three frames, then every time we run an instruction, what percentage of the time do we say that page is not in memory, we have to go out to the disk drive to get it? So with that being the case, if we were the only process running on the processor, what percentage of the time will we be using the, the CPU and what percent of the time will we be just sitting there waiting for the disk drive to come in? So let's say we have, for example, for example, little t equals one nanosecond, big T equals ten nanoseconds, and the miss ratio, if they gave us, let's say they gave us three three frames, so our miss ratio is one tenth. One tenth of the time we issue an instruction and we say the page is in here, we go out to the disk drive to get it. What percentage of the time, so the question is, we're going to use the Greek letter mu to mean, so we'll use this letter again when we talk about queuing theory later on. This is the percentage of the time we're executing as opposed to the percentage of the time we're waiting for a page to come in from the disk. So right now we're the only processor in the whole, only process in the whole system. What's the percentage of time we're executing? It would be the time it takes, it would be little t divided by the time it takes to run an instruction plus bring in a page from memory times the percentage of times we have to do that, times m of s. So this would end up being, in this example, 1 divided by 1 plus 10 times 1 tenth, which ends up being half the time. So, I mean, I set the numbers to make it a somewhat easy example. But if we were, so what this is really saying is, if an instruction takes one nanosecond to run, going out to the disk drive to bring a page in takes 10 nanoseconds. And let's say that happens one-tenth of the time. Then half our time, this is how long it takes to run an instruction, but this is what we're typically doing per time unit. Half the time, this, this amount of time we're running instruction, this is the amount of time we're spending going out to the disk drive. So 50% of the time, we would be running on the processor, and 50% of the time we're waiting for a page to come in. Now suppose there are two processes on the system, on, on our operating system. If, every, if we were given, if both processes were given unlimited frames, what percentage of the time would they be running anyway? Assuming does none of them are higher priority than the other. Let's say the operating system keeps splitting them up. If they were given unlimited resources and they anything they ever wanted, they got, what percentage of the time would they be running? About 50 percent. 50 percent. So what, the, what we're basically saying here is with this working set, you're, the operating system is going to give you a certain set of pages to um, operate with. The operating system knows statistically how long it takes to go out to the disk drive and bring a page in. It knows how long its processor speed is. So it gives you a certain set of pages, like we did in the last example, and with those pages, you're going to have a miss ratio. It can monitor your miss ratio. You're missing one-tenth of the time. It gives you an extra page. Now you're missing one-twentieth of the time. If it takes pages away, you start getting a higher miss ratio, but it can calculate your miss ratio. But if we have your miss ratio, 
based on the number of frames we could give you, we were going to cause you to max out at a certain percentage of the time you'll be on the processor anyway. If we did this for n processes, what would the formula look like? Um, the utilization of process i, assuming there are n processes in the system, the utilization is going to be time it takes to run an instruction divided by time it takes to run an instruction plus time it takes to get a page from the disk drive times the misratio of process i given a certain set of pages that the operating system gave to process i. As long as this number is as big or equal to 1 over n, the number of processes in the, in the uh, operating system at the moment, we're not really hurting this process by limiting it to a size of n. In other words, if all the processes were given every resource they could ever want, they're only going to be on the processor one out of n percentage of the time. Right? If there's 50 processes in the computer, you're only going to be on the processor 2% of the time if you were given everything you ever needed. Right? So if we, made, if we gave them a limited number of frames so that their miss ratio hit a certain number, and therefore the most they could ever do is be on the processor 50% of the time, we're really not hurting them. Because that's the best they could have done anyway. So then you start to think, well, I mean, th does, that, does that make sense? That if, if we gave processes an unlimited amount of resources, they're only going to be on the processor one over n times anyway. If we then limited them to a certain number of page frames, where they could only, they're, they're going to spend 1 over n time running and n minus 1 over n waiting for disk, the disk to come in. It really doesn't affect them because they were going to be waiting anyway. Instead of sitting on the ready queue doing nothing, now they're using all their waiting time to go out to the disk drive to get pages. But the amount of time they'll spend on the processor will end up being the same. It's only when the miss ratio gets so high that we hit a point where all the processes might be waiting for a page to come in and nothing's being done. I'm not saying we should just go out of our way to give them less than they need. If the, if the operating system has leftover frames, they could give those frames out. Especially if there's only one process at a time. Right. But there's, there, there comes a, there's a, a number of page frame, there's a working set size, that's what that's the number of frames the operating system gives to a process. There comes a certain size where giving them more actually doesn't benefit them. It doesn't hurt them. But they would they were only going to be on the processor one over n amount of the time if you gave them everything. And there's a certain set size that if you gave them that the most they could ever do is be one out of n anyway. So you're not really helping them much more. Then comes the question of what if the amount of frame, frames that are given out are done in such a way that every process running independent would be spending this much time running and n minus 1 over n going out to the disk drive and then a new process wanted to be added to the system. So in other words, all, all the frames are maxed out. All the processes that are running are still being managed so that the CPU is running 100% of the time and a new one wants to be added. We could take a frame, like one or two frames from each of the processes that are running and give it to this new one. Would that make sense to do? Well, what's the, again, it's operating system, so there's no right answer, but what's like your comment on that? We're getting, let's say N was 10 processes, 10 are running and now an 11th one is trying to come in. We gave out enough frames so that all 10 of the processes are spending 10% of the time running and 90% of the time waiting for the disk drive to bring a page in. They're still running, the CPU is still running at 100%. It's really not a, a big issue. But if we started taking frames away from the 10 to make room for an 11, 
then their miss ratio is going to go so high that they can't even run 1 11th of the time. So there's going to be scenarios where all 11 processes are waiting for the disk drive. And now the CPU's utilization is not 100%. And the CPU, so we think we're making life better by letting the 11th one in, but we're actually slowing, obviously we're slowing the other 10 down, but now we're slowing it down to the point where the CPU isn't even being utilized 100%. So it would actually be better to block that one from entering until some frames opened up and then let it in. So the, the overall throughput of the system would be better. So we want to at least maintain a 100, try to get as close as we can to 100% CPU utilization before we consider letting a new one in. But we really don't have to worry about giving a process more frames than is necessary. All we have to do is manage that miss ratio to the point where this equation stays consistent. And then we don't really need to give them more frames. If we give them more frames, they, it won't increase the amount of time they're on the uh, CPU because the operating system is time sharing it with other processes anyway. It doesn't help them. It just keeps them steady.